Okay, so you learned about the binomial distribution. I explained this a formula, explained the components of the formula, and we applied it as opposed to the way I taught how to solve problems um, like this in probability, I began to refer to this sort of a problem as a binomial problem. And we use instead the formula, binomial formula. And then I solve some problems and hopefully you could go on and solve the rest of them that are in the homework. And uh, there are a lot of problems in the homework. The solutions for the homework are available, remember, at the top of the Moodle platform. So you can verify your work. Also, you can use Excel. I believe I explained how to use Excel as well. Is that, tr is that correct? So you can use Excel to generate the whole binomial distribution and how to com <clears throat> combine certain values of the outcome. So basically you could generate the table for yourself. This one is for n equals 15 and the probabilities, there used to exist tables. And now we have Excel, we can generate them ourselves. You could even get these tables online if you had to. This is a cumulative table. It adds up um, probabilities to the left, just like you're used to seeing on the normal distribution, but I taught you how to generate it so it just shows each value. And now we have a way of, uh, now for discrete distributions like the binomial, I explained that we're calculating the probability for an ex a um, for a value of the variable. So you actually get to use equals now different from the continuous distribution, because if you ask for the probability at a point, it's gonna be zero. So binomial distribution looks like, um, oh, I have it in the other drawing. I don't have a drawing here. Yeah, I'm gonna go forward. Sorry, sorry, I'm scrolling, scrolling. So I have a bunch of problems there. I talk about the other distributions. Again, I'm not gonna test you on Poisson and hypergeometric, but I just introduced two other distributions that are popular that apply. And I'm, my references here are to the, um, the other textbook, not to the textbook I've told you to purchase. So, but you can find it in your textbook that you purchased for sure. Um, that's for the Newman textbook or the Newbold textbook, sorry. All right, so I'm just going to scroll here to show this. Okay, so this is an example of a binomial distribution and it's not exactly symmetric. It's kind of symmetric. Um, so binomial distributions don't have to be symmetric, but I explained to you the conditions well, a condition where it is symmetric is where the probability is equal to 50%. Um, so I told you how to generate the probability distribution. And I show you how to get the, the mean of the distribution. The mean of the distribution, remember from last week, we just multiply the outcome and its probability in a weighted mean, and you can calculate it that way. But I explained to you for the binomial, it's, it's even easier. You use this formula here. This is the mean of the distribution. Remember, I'm using the symbol mu for Greek letters because this is a distribution. It's actually the population <clears throat> distribution. So I explain how this is the mean. Um, <clears throat> with the example above. And then I just ask you to accept that this is the standard deviation. But I can derive both of these from the first principles. Um, so why is it the mean? So it's uh, the mean 
I am projecting. I've been projecting the whole time. Yeah, it, I'm projecting, Carla. I can well, see. I can. Sorry. Okay, I, I want to hear. You know what? Somehow the setup that I have it it just jumbles everything around. You have to you have to find the the image. Okay, so I'm just here. This is halfway. Um, this is after learning the binomial. Can I start here as a review? Does anyone want me to start further back or? Yes, is for okay. We're okay to start here. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's read the exercise here. I'm going to minimize you guys. Put you here. All right, so. Okay, the mean simply said the expected number of successes is the mean. This should be the probability of success of a success times the number of trials. Okay, why? Here's an example um, to help you understand. So if a basketball player makes 80% of her free throws, so this is just throwing um, to the basket, right? Um And she tries 10 times. Then out of the 10 times, if 80% applies or is consistent, then 0.8 times 10, so of is represented by the bor, like the multiplication sign, is 8. So... The idea there is that if we know for sure she makes 80% and that's consistent um, on average, so if this is the long run relative frequency, how I explain probability in module six, then on average, she'll make 8.8 8 out of 10. So then eight out of 10 is eight. or 0.80%, let's say it that way, of 10 is eight. So that's how you know it's the mean. And now the standard deviation, it has this calculation. Now you need, this is gonna be used again. So it's worth memorizing this, all right? Even though you're gonna have a formula sheet to work with, it's worth memorizing this. And um, that's, the var that's the standard deviation where the variance is found above. So I actually apply the rules of mean and variances to demonstrate the mean of a the mean well here actually I demonstrate the mean of um the count variable I refer to it as the count variable x And um, with this distribution, S is, uh, okay, so we begin with the event. Each individual event, each time I observe a phenomena, the chance of success is P, and the chance of failure is 1 minus P. Now, for this setup, it's called a Bernoulli trial. The mean is, well, I multiply zero to the outcome times the probability in general, plus the outcome times the probability. And this summer, um, simplifies to P. So it means that the mean outcome on a Bernoulli trial is just the probability of seeing a success. And then I get the variance doing the same thing using the same formula that we know and go through the algebra. And I get this, P1 minus P. Now, I'm not done. That's just each time I look. But in the binomial setting, I look several times. I look N times. So what we actually have is a new variable. 
called x, I use a symbol up here, s instead, to differentiate. And what I do is I add them together because I'm just counting. I'm going to count, as, you know, success or failure on the first try, or I'm looking for a success, right? That's the binomial definition, the number of successes. So I'm counting success or success or success. So I'm adding them. The or means just add them up. So that's the new variable. So I want to use the rule. So now we're going to employ the rules of means and variances that I took some time to review at the end of last the last meeting. And the, the, the mean of the sum of variables is the sum of the means. So I just add them together. And that's where the NP comes from. So now I've shown you logically why the mean is, or the expected value is NP. And now I've, and here I've shown you mathematically or using statistical rules. Same thing with the variance. Um, now I explained uh, when I talked about the rules of mean and variances, for variances, you can add them. When can you take the, so the variance of a sum of variables is the sum of the variance. When is that true? There's only one condition where that's true. It's not necessarily true, if you remember, because there was an extra term and you had to make a matrix and it was quite involved. So when is it true that you can just add the variances? Do you remember? You can go back and look. When is it true that you can just add the variances? So let me remind you As we were talking last class, oh, I have a question here. I should review that. Yes, Jordan is right. So here I talked about the rules of mean and variances. Here were some examples back in module six. And the rule was so he, here, if you have if you have more than two, sorry, if you have two uh, variables that you're adding, the variance is their sum, but this there's this extra term here that I derived at the end of last class. And um so the only time that you don't have the extra term is when the variables are independent. And remember, independence is a criteria for the trials for the binomial, all right? So they have to be N independent trials. So see, that's, that's the result of assuming independence that you get the simple summation of the variances. Notice that... Um, here I'm using, these are all the different outcomes, S1, because that's the first, the second, that's what it's saying. And uh, so, yeah, we don't have any extra turns. We don't have to make the matrix. We simply add these together because each trial is independent from the other. So I add those together. And how many are there? There's N of them. So that's where the N P1 minus P comes from. That's the variance. So the standard deviation is the square root. All right, so you have the ability, the knowledge to be able to read this. I'm never gonna test you on this, but you should feel comfortable that this doesn't come out of um, the air, that it has foundation, okay? So the binomial distribution has a mean and a variance, which we present as the standard deviation, we take the square root. The mean is NP and the standard deviation is NP one minus P square root. And that result 
is presented in the formula sheet at the end. So I told you last class, I'm going to want, I want you to print out or recopy the formula sheet at the end because we're going to use it. I'm going to teach with this. So here's the first one. If X it has a binomial distribution with parameters N and P, then X has a mean of NP and a standard deviation NP1 minus P with a square root. And this, for e each individual outcome or number of successes, K, this is the formula. Okay, so that's the summary there for the formula if you need it. And I just showed you where it came from, which I don't expect all of you to deeply understand, but hopefully um, it will be more, you'll be more anchored in the, you know, the reason why you learned, we learned what we did, the probability theory was to be able to derive formula like this for different kinds of variables. So this is what I want to talk about next, this bracket. Okay, so in this bracket, we make a point. X is also approximately normally distributed provided n times p is greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. And the population size is large. Okay, so what am I talking about here? So I'm going to scroll back, close your eyes, if it makes you dizzy. All right, so here. So what I'm talking about is, although this is not exactly a symmetric distribution, we talked about the conditions for a symmetric distribution being that P equals 0.5. But there's another condition or special case when a binomial distribution is approximately normal. And that is where n times p is greater than or equal to 10 and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. It is a condition where the distribution that's just spiked that we learn about is smooth, bell-shaped, and approximately normal, okay? What's normal mean again? What does normal mean again? Is that 68 or most of the data is one standard deviation from the mean and 95% uh, of the observations are two standard deviations from the mean and 99.7 of the observations are three standard deviations from the mean, but there's also a few outliers. 0.3% of observations are outside three standard deviations and are outliers. Okay, so that's what normal means. This looks a little bit different than the spike as I built this area around the spikes to make it continuous because remember, I told you about continuous distributions and now you're learning about discrete distributions. So just to say that the normal, that the, sorry, that uh, the binomial becomes normal or we're saying it approximates the normal, uh, the binomial approximates a normal. What we want to do is be able to use our, the, the rules or the, the normal distribution and its properties to estimate outcomes. And uh, that's strange because now we've, we've gone from a discrete to a, a continuous distribution. So what we're assuming is that like we have this, you know, we're filling it up with area around, oh, we're gonna fill it with area around each bar. So it um, looks approximately normal, okay. So what's the point of all of this? What we're gonna do with the binomial distribution is use it in sampling theory. So what is sampling theory? We take a sample of a population and um, we use the sample to tell us something about the population. 
Okay. We're, so we're building theory to say, uh, right now, what we're doing is I'm telling you the properties of the population and we're calculating expected outcomes in the sample. So we're going from the population information. So this is population information here, you see. And then I, I can come up with expectations of outcomes on the sample using this theory that I've, you know, developed. In reality, we don't know the population parameters or characteristics. We just work in practice with a sample and we use the sample to tell us something about the population. We go backwards. So we're building a bridge to go back and forth between sample and population. That's what we're doing. That makes it easier to understand. So first, let's work with the population information. Let's say you're given a binomial distribution with 100 trials and the outcome, the probability of a success is one third. So find the probability that you get more than 23 successes. What would that take? What would we have to do to solve that using the binomial distribution? What would we have to do? What would we have to do? No answers, no no clue, no not sure. Mm. Mm, that's not my that's not my question. My question is oh I'm gonna stop share. Okay, so my question is. To solve this problem, we have to take probability, so we have to think about if X is binomial one hundred and one third, this is N, this is N and this is P, what I have to calculate is the probability of X. Well, let me let me make this bigger. So x is equal to 0, or 1, or 2, or 3, or 23, 24. OK, so these are all the possible outcomes. No successes, all the way to 100 successes. And I just want greater than 23 greater, greater than 23 is 24 to 100 so i would have to add together 24 plus x equals 25 plus x equals 26 plus 
x equals 100. So I'd have to do, I'd have to make that calculation, which is fine. I mean, we can generate a table of values in Excel and just add those together, or we could calculate with the table, the cumulative distribution up to 23, and then take that away from one to get this. So I could do that um, to find my answer. Does anybody want me to show you how to do that? We could do that. You want to see that? Okay, so let's see. Let me go to, back to Excel and come back here. So let's let's do it in Excel. And I can show you it's possible, but it wasn't practical. It was kind of time wasting. And it's also interesting, you know, theoretically interesting that statisticians came up with the substitution or the approximation. So let me show you the long way with Excel first. Okay, so what we're going to do is generate the distribution going down like this. I could do it across, um, but I'm going to go down. <laughs> I could do it across to make it look like I, it usually looks. Okay, so I can I can take this um, down to 100. I'm going to just copy that for the pattern, and then I can go all the way to 101 because it starts at zero, right? So that's Excel. And then here, I'm going to use BIN, and you see a bunch of things pop up. So which one do I want? Which one should I pick? Binom distribution. Yeah. And it asks for the number. Um, that I'm looking for. It's asking first for the K, so the value. So I'm gonna put A1 in there because I'm gonna use a reference and and then copy it down to all the rest. So A1, and then the number of trials, we're going to have 100 trials where the probability was um, one out of three. Let's see if I can just write that. I don't even know if I can write that. I don't know if it's going to like that. And, and cumulative, we're going to say... We can just say um, we want a cumulative. Let's just do zero though, no cumulative. So it gives us the value equals. Is this gonna work? Oh, it worked. Okay, so it understood one over three, which is cool. And it's this long, it's an um, it's an exponent, it's um, in, in scientific notation, it's a very small number, right? So when it's negative, it means that there's um, 18, 18 zeros back so you have to take that decimal and go back so it's like 17 zeros in front of the two that's what that means and i want to change that format into just a regular number is that going to work and i'm not going to restrict the decimals Oh, I don't want it scientific. It's in scientific right now. I want it to be general. Let's see if it works just general. No. I want it to be uh, a number, but I don't want to restrict the decimals. It needs to be like a ton of decimals. 
So that's really what the number is. It's very small, right? The chance that you throw that you observe a hundred times and you have actually absolutely no success is it's very small. That's what it means. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this down here. So what it does is it uses the next one, right? So if I copy it, it just uses the one on the next column. It's um it's related to the column below. So I just double click all that all the way down and there it is. So that is the binomial distribution for 100. You can see how tedious this is, right? So you can see that it is um these are a bunch of small numbers and I told you or explained in the um in the videos that if it's more than negative 4 or negative five, sorry, it's basically zero. These are all just zero, but I'm just showing, demonstrating what kind of zero it is. It's a really small number. So what I want to do though is, um, that's, that's, that's the formula if I do each one at a time. Now let's do the cumulative. Let's do this again. So bin distribution and uh, for, I'm going to start with this one, and then the probability is 1 over 3, which is great that I can do that because I do not want to, um, I don't want to put an estimate of one third. I always want to use the fractions because rounding distorts your result. And then the probability is that, and I want to say cumulative. Now I'm going to say 1. I forgot to put trials of 100, trials of 100. Thank you, Christina. And then one. Okay, so the, the numbers are gonna look similar. I'm gonna change the formatting so I can see this. So I'm gonna tell it I want a bunch of decimals because otherwise it just does what it wants. All right. And then copying it down, it's going to add these together for the next one. So it's going to be like one, two, four, well, five, three, no, four. Anyway, whatever. It's going to add this way. It's going to be a four on the end and then whatever it's going to add. All right. So it's a, a four. Oh, it gave me an extra decimal here. Because it bumps it up. Yeah, I have to go this way to set to add. I don't know why I have a two. So anyway, let's work with this. So this is cumulative. This is adding these together, adding as you go. And so we have to go up till 24. So up to 24 is here. So this is equal to probability x less than or equals 24. That's what that is. So if we want to find the probability that uh, it's greater than that, we would take uh, one minus this. Oh, let me write it. So if we want probability that X is greater, which was the original question. Is that the original question or was it, hold on, 23, sorry, okay. Greater than 20. So it was greater than 23. It's greater than 23. Greater than 23, what's greater than 23? Greater than 23 is 24 or more, right? So I'm going to go. To less than or equal to 23.
So if I take this less than or equal to 23, that's what that is. And then everything after is greater than 24. So I could take, so either greater than 23, I could add all of these together over here because these are individuals. So that's one way to do it. Let me move this over here. So one way to do it is to add everything after 24, which is, you can do in Excel, but imagine doing this manually and the mistakes you can make. Okay, so that's X greater than or equal to 23. Or you can go cumulative. <clears throat> um, up to 23, including 23, and some, oh, and sum these up. Where am I? So that's 24, up to 23 is line 24. And so that's, it's already calculated for me in this case, right? And, um, and I can take one minus that. So this would be greater than 20. You see how they're the same answer? Okay, so these are the same answer because either I add all of them going 24 or higher or I calculate the ones up to and, um, up to and including 23 and subtract them from one. I get the same answer. And in terms of time... Uh, it's probably if you have to do this manually, it's easier to get 20 to add 23 than to do um, 24 to 100, right? So it would be easier to do it this way if you had to do it manually. All right, so that's the way to do it if you had the time, patience, and uh, You can do it exactly, but we're gonna use the normal distribution instead to make an approximation and let's see how close we get. So this to four decimal places, cause I'm, I'm asking you to round just to four decimal places. It's 0.9836 would be rounded to four decimal places. All right, so let's go look at what it becomes if I use the normal approximation. I hope you're not, I hope you're appreciating this. It's not confusing. I, I'm just showing a little bit of background what is happening. Okay, so let me go back to my iPad. So let's say we didn't want to do that and add up from 24 to 100. Instead, we're going to check to make sure that um, <clears throat> n times p, which is 100 times 1 third, is um, 
greater than 10, right? So it has to be greater than or equal to, to satisfy the conditions. And n times one minus p, which is 100 times two thirds, also is greater than 10. Everyone agrees, right? So we can use a normal approximation so that binomial becomes um, approximately normal. I use the double tilde to mean approximate with a mean of NP and a standard deviation of NP one minus P square root. So it's because it was worked out that that's those that will satisfy by doing that, by checking that it's spread out and bell shaped looking enough um, like a normal distribution that we can use the normal approximation. So all we have to do is find NP, N times P we already have. And um, N times one minus, uh, N times P one minus P is equal to um, 100 times one third times two thirds. What does that give you? Four point seventy one. Yes, very good. Four point seventy one. So I can replace this here because I have an iPad and it's easier to erase. I can put that here, right? And I'm just holding two decimal places using my rules about decimal places. Usually I stick with the rules, but um, so the rule is right, two more decimal places than you start with. And so that's, that's how I round those. But in general for probabilities, I keep uh, yeah, I keep up to four for probabilities. Now, this is not probabilities yet, but okay. These are just count. Remember, X is a count variable. All right, so what do I do next? So I want to answer the question, probability X greater than 23 is um, approximately, right? If you standardize X with a mean and standard deviation, you answer the question like we did in the past in the units before this. So you can use the binom, you can use the normal distribution approach. So 23, minus 33.33 divided by 4.71, which if you want, you can put that into Excel. Also, you know, I'm just keeping two decimal places because our table just goes till two. Draw the picture, negative, and going this way, that's the arrow, goes this way for negative 2.19. We want that red area, but we look up on our table and we find the area to the left is what? Because that's what the table gives us.
It's here, right? Right. So the area to the left that we found is 0 0.0143, but we want the other side. So it's one minus 0 0.0143. And this number should look familiar. Nine eight seven five or five seven. It's five seven. I reversed it. I knew that, but I wrote the wrong one, five, seven. All right, so what did we get in the Excel table? Nine, eight, three, six, right? So on the Excel table, they're different. How do I, what, how do I reconcile that they're different? Why are they different? I expected them to be different. Similar, but different. Why are they different? And which one is the right one? That's, that's even another question. So this one is called the exact value. And this call, this one is called the approximate value. This is an approximation. And that's why they're different. All right. And so questions about that. Professor, I, I, I've been doing it on Excel and the the number it gave me was 98.58. It was in 98.36. X greater than 23. So this is X greater than 23. That's pretty much x greater than 23. I'm not sure, you'd have to send it to me, but this is x greater than 23. Do you agree? Um, let me show you the Excel. So I've added together x greater than 23, it starts at 24. And then I verified it over here. That's what makes me even more sure is that I verified it. So this is um, up until 23, not including. So you have to know like these arrows here, the arrow greater than 23 means do not include 23. So um, this does not include 23. And then over here, I used X less than or equal to 23. Sorry. X less than or equal to 23. Because this is cumulative. This is up to 23, including 23. Oh, Patricia, you're good. <laughs> you're good. Okay, so this is... um. 20 up to including 23 this is greater than 23 okay and so okay so so the answer i get on the excel is 9836 but then um 
on my iPad doing it with the approximation, I'm a little bit off. I get 9857. And no, you don't have to do both of those. You just have to answer the question. So if they if I ask you for the exact value, you'd have to use Excel or the thing I'm going to show you next. Um, if I ask you to get the approximation, you use the normal approximation. Does that make sense? So you look for these words, exact or approximation. Now, it's, it's just a little bit off. It's not perfect, but I mean, the statisticians were satisfied with this and they were proud of themselves that they... Uh, so just to be clear, hmm? um, when you're asked for the approximation, you're asking us to do it like um, from the, the... Right? But the then normal. if asked for the exact one is the binomial approach. For exact, you use... Can you not see my screen? I have it on the screen. For the exact, you, you do it with Excel. You do step by step, you know, one at a time. You add them together. And if you're asked for the approximation, you can use the normal distribution to approximate the way I just did. Now, all these exercises here. First one we made was the, the binomial approach, right? I did both. I, I know, both. but the exact one for the ninety-eight thirty-six, we use the the binomial. Yeah. Okay. We use the binomial for the approximation. We use the normal. So if you didn't understand normal well, you got to go back and learn the normal or know the normal to feel confident here. Um, <clears throat> because that's what we're going to lean on. Um, so I did, yeah, 98.57. Okay. All right. So I have a bunch of exercises to practice. Well, I have just two here, but I'm going to have more exercises. This is another one here where I go back to the original problem about um, finding out if someone has ESP using the normal approximation. You still get the same answer. Like it's very unlikely that someone just guessing will be found to have ESP. Um, but it's just a different approach to answering that problem, that type of a problem, uh, a problem where you have to add a lot together. You can just use the approximation. Here, I introduce a variation on the same problem, the same problem of the number of successes and then trials. I'm going to convert the number of successes into the proportion of successes. And, and I introduce this new thing. This is actually, what is this? What do I call this? What do I call X, by the way? I refer to X as when I write this, all this stuff about X, so X is the outcome X here is the outcome of, of uh, a number. Okay, so I'm going to repeat, repeatedly look. So in this case, it was five times. In the, um, this example, it was 100 times. And the chance of seeing what I'm looking for is one third. So I'm going to count the number of successes. X is actually an example of a statistic. X is a statistic. Also, P hat is a statistic. Now, these statistics have distributions. That's what we've derived. That's what we're talking about. Um, and there's a pattern to the distribution that we're exploiting now, since X 
has an approximate normal distribution given certain conditions. P hat also has an approximately um, normal distribution. So we're going to see this and this both as statistics. So what I do here is I'm going to borrow. Remember I told you the reason why we learn the rules of means and variances is so that we can use the knowledge of one distribution to talk about another distribution that is created from the original one as a linear transformation or as a sum of two distributions, two variables. So we had some rules about that to avoid having to read develop the whole distribution, right? We don't have to rederive it. We don't want to have to go get data and observe for a long period of time and then um, see if it has, you know, what whatever kind of pattern it has. So instead, we're going to do the same thing here where the proportion, so what do I mean proportion? Well, if you have 100 So if X is binomial with a hundred trials and the chance of a success in each trial is one third, then what would you expect the distribution? Okay, wait, and I got to do one more step. Since n times p is greater than or equal to 10 and n times 1 minus p, which we checked, was greater than or equal to 10, then um, x was approximately normal. I'm just repeating what I said before. With a mean of n and p and a standard deviation n p 1 minus p square root. All right. This is all going to come into practice, okay? We're just nailing down this these calculations. And we actually found that this was 33.33 um, .33, and we found that is 4.71, right? Then what do you expect about p hat? What is p hat? p hat is x over n. So let's say we're talking about 23 out of 100 successes. What would P hat be? P hat would be X over N. Let's plug it in. 23 out of 100, which is? So it converts the number, the count, into a probability or a proportion, sorry, I should say. So this is known as the sample count. This one is called the sample count. And this one, well, I could refer to it as that. And this is called the sample proportion. And in reality, in practice, when you hear about a poll, an election poll, they tell you about the percentage, the estimated percentage of people who will support a certain candidate, right? They don't tell you about the number of people. Well, they could do that too, but usually they report as a percentage. So <clears throat> that's why I introduced this here, because you need to know about that, how you talk about things as a proportion. So it's, it's the same thing that we just learned, but I have to um, reconfigure my mean and standard deviation to, to comply with the fact that I'm talking about the proportion. Now, how do I do that? If I divide x by n 
should I be able to just divide the mean and the standard deviation by n? If you remember back to the rules of means and variances, or you just trust me, yes, you can. Okay. So when I divide, So I use this notation to distinguish between them. The mean for the x variable was np. If I divide that by n, I get the mean of p hat, because I'm dividing x by n. I'm going to divide the mean by n. I just get p. Now, does that make sense? What's the expected value in proportion if uh, you have a binomial distribution? Well, that pretty much defines what p is, right? p hat is, should be equal to p. Um, or, sorry, the mean should be equal to p on, as an expected value. I should, uh, on average, The true proportion should be the expected value. That's pretty much what the definition is of it on average. And then I'm going to divide sigma x. Sigma x was equal to n p 1 minus p square root. I'm going to divide that by n, and I get this. How do I get this if I divide this by n? I need to do the math somewhere. I think I have it below. Yes. So here I do it here. So I'm going to divide the mean here by n, and that makes p. And I'm going to divide the standard deviation by n, and I do a, a few things. First, I put the n in the, the root sign. To do that, I have to square the n on the bottom. And then one n on the top cancels with two n's on the bottom. And that's my result. So this is now a variation on what I just taught you before. But it's talking about p hat being approximately normal with a mean of p and a standard deviation, p1 minus p over n. Do you have to memorize this? No, but it's good to have, <clears throat> It's. I mean, it would. I recommend that you do just so that you don't get blown away because everything looks similar. <laughs> now, one thing to help you is the formula sheet. I put it on the formula sheet. It's right here. Number two on the formula sheet. You see how we're advancing through the formula sheet? We're already on number two. And you're like, what did we do? We didn't do anything. But we did, because we built all that theory. We spent the whole semester, trimester, learning the theory so I could speed through this stuff. <clears throat> Hopefully, you're with me still. So the first one was about the binomial and the mean and standard deviation. And then the second one is about the sampling distribution, p hat, which is x over n. And it has a mean of p and a standard deviation p1 minus p over n. That's all the number two says, the thing I just demonstrated. So you need to use those more than you have to explain where they come from. So hopefully that's reassuring. And I refer to this as This is from the binomial material, but it's also with regards to SDS. SDS is the sampling distribution of a statistic. The sampling distribution of, of a statistic.
And this material is also from the sampling, the, the material on a sampling distribution of a statistic, SDS. So in the first case, X is the statistic. In the second, P hat is a statistic. And it has a distribution. Provided a, a normal distribution approximately provided n, in, n times p is greater than or equal to 10 and n times one minus p is greater than or equal to 10. And the population is large. I keep saying that um, for small populations, there's different results. Now what's large, what's small? Um, it's just a condition that allows these to be true. <laughs> okay, so usually you'll see me say it's large. So there's different results that I don't get into because, um, but if you did have some, like, uh, what you would have to do is estimate these for your, for your um, certain condition and make sure that the estimates are not so different for large and small population. But I'm not going to talk about situations with a relatively small population. We're going to say the conditions are such that uh, the subpopulation is large enough to make these be true. It's just an assumption. There's lots of assumptions behind what we do. And I mention them and other professors don't even mention them. But um, I'm just letting you know. So I call X the sample count. And I call P the sample proportion. And they are related. And P, you're going to do much more. This is more popular to use P hat. But we derive this all about P hat from X. Okay, I'm not going to take a break because I I wasted 20 minutes. I'll just continue. Um, do you have any questions? I'm going to repeat myself about this. Um, it might just be over some people's head or they, they don't follow. But the most important thing is that you recognize that we built this theory up to talk about a variable X, which is counting the number of successes in so many trials. And from there we created the proportion, the sample proportion, that's the main thing. And that you have this, these results on the formula sheet to refer back to, because we're gonna be using them. These are true provided, sorry, the approximation to the, the normal distribution is only possible provided that um, this condition is met and we're going to test the condition each time in module eight but later I we don't test it um, you'll just see that it's going to be true but you should get into the habit of testing it for now so you don't forget all right so hopefully this is helpful so far so then what is this about over here so there's a bunch of exercises here and they're not hard. Um, you're just going to try, you're going to try the problems solving for the same ones you did when um, I asked you questions about a variable X that was a binomial. I'm going to ask the same question about the sample proportion. So for instance,
just gonna grab a drink. Hold on. And this problem here. We talked about um, the conditions for a person to be believed to have ESP, extrasensory perception, was that you would guess 50 or more cards out of 100 correctly. 50 out of 100 is the same as Fifty percent. Okay. So we're going to answer the same problem, but looking at the percentage of observations, not the count. And it just means that we used this calculation for the mean and standard deviation instead. But we performed the same. Uh, we 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 use the same. Oh, we use the normal distribution with this new mean and standard deviation. And we get the same results. So there's a lot of problems like that. For you to repeat the same problems with doing them with a different technique. And then that then we arrive here. I mentioned that the continuity correction factor is not going to be on your test, but it's important to put it here because if you use software, let's say you were trying to make calculations or estimates and you use software, you'll be able to specify if you want it to use a continuity correction. Now, the attempt here is to adjust for the approximation. And so this might be intimidating, but all, all this is saying is we're going to account for the fact that there was density added to the spikes. So remember this drawing back here. I told you we're gonna use the normal distribution and it's gonna be an approximation, but we can even get closer to the true value if we add or account for this area around each spike. Um, and that should make it a little better. So let's see what I'm talking about. So let's say we we'll work with the twenty three that we that that's the one I want that we calculated all the way. So here was the original question for a hundred trials. The probability of success is one third. <clears throat> Find the probability x is greater than twenty three. So if this is the 23rd spike, I'm going to build that area around it. And to be bigger than the spike would now mean to be bigger than this. And the area that I'm adding around is just 0.5 on each side. So this spike, we'll make this a little smaller.
So that would take me to 23.5 and this would take me to 22.5. So I have to make a continuity correction factor rather than 23, greater than 23, I'm gonna start at 23.5 and put the 23.5 in there. <clears throat> um, just to, just to take this a step more, then the next one would be 24, right? So I want to stay clear of I want to I want to get this extra little bit here before the spike. I want to catch that. That's basically what it's doing. So if I solve this, what what is the difference? Do I actually make up do I get closer to the exact? So now you're going to do um standardize the same mean 33.33 and the same standard deviation 4.71 and what do you get Right, now we have 2.09. Okay, let's see. What is that now? It's a little bit more. Point oh one eight So we have to take one minus because we want this side. And how much is that? 91.87. Ninety one point eight seven. Um, ninety eight point one seven. I don't know, you guys throw me off. It was oh, okay, ninety eight point one seven. 
98.17. You guys subtracted wrong. How could you guys all subtract wrong? Okay. Um, <clears throat> 0 0.0183. Let me double check. That's zero. Point zero one eight three ninety eight point one seven and let me go back and see what did I get here? Right here. All right, well, it's not perfect, but it gets me closer. So this was what we got in our approximation, 98.57. This was the exact, if we used Excel, and if we do the correction, 98.17 with the continuity correction. So this ends up a little bit smaller. I guess it's closer to the exact one anyway. So it's an attempt to improve your approximation, but it it under it's underestimates so anyway. But this is still considered a better approximation than the raw approximation. So anyway, I'm not going to put it on the test because it's a whole other thing, but uh, that's how you do the continuity correction. They're all different, but this is the exact one. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to spend more time with that, but well, let me just say about it. All that this means <clears throat> up here is given the question, it's a different correction. So what we did was for greater than this, we just did equals and added the 0.5. But each of these you could figure out one by one if you needed to, um, doing the same assessment that I did here. <clears throat> so if I had, um, I'll just do one. So let's say it was x less than or equal to 20. I'll change the number. Less than or equal to 20. Say this is 20. I, I put a bar around. So now I want to include 20 and everything before it. That's what this means, including 20. So I have to extend over here to, ca to capture the bar around the 20th spike. So this would be 20.5, and that's why you add 5. Okay, so that's how that works. Okay, I'm not going to spend more time on that. It's not hard. Just uh, I explain how that works. And it improves your, it's supposed to improve your approximation. And I have a bunch of exercises here for you to practice with. So that brings us, I made some videos about this material that you should watch because I don't have time now, but <clears throat> let's go to the uh, formula sheet. <clears throat> All right, so we learned about a binomial distribution, and <clears throat> you can understand or appreciate that we're going to use it for sampling because it's all about 
observing repeatedly to look for something. It's like a sample, right? It's a sample. And I refer to the outcome X as a statistics. And then I refer to the outcome as a proportion, as the sample proportion, also as a statistic. And these are quite popular <clears throat> because we care about polls, we care about the proportion of people who um, survive a treatment, we care about, so you'll see that <clears throat> in real life, a lot of results refer to the proportion of outcomes. Also, we care about variables <clears throat> that result from or variables that have a um, that are a measurement or have a continuous distribution. Let me do this by example before I come here. I'm going to go back. Sorry, making you flip around. Let's go by example. So I explained all this theory here that I derive. And here's an example. This will be the best way with the time that we have. We're going to start here. And I'm just going to apply without deriving. <clears throat> but you can go back and see the derivation. Here's a problem. Let X be a variable in a large population. So it's large enough to support what we're doing. Okay, so that's why I use the word large. It supports the theory or the uh, results of theory that I'm applying. Assume that X is normally distributed with a mean of 13.8 and a standard deviation of 2.9. Let X bar denote the sample mean viewed as a variable calculated from uh, simple random samples of size nine. So I am on page 35. I'm on page State the distribution of X bar, include the name and the relevant parameters. So it is a case that if you begin with a known population, so if you begin with a population and you're interested in a characteristic of that population, and that population has a normal distribution with a mean given, So that could be like um, I have some examples down there and I stay pretty raw here. Let's say this is, this is the results of a test or a quiz with 15 questions and the average result was 13.8 with a standard deviation 2.9. So we can think about it like that, okay? So it's a, a large quiz I gave to hundreds of students that I have in a large uh, class or section of a course, and that was the average, 13.8, and that's the standard deviation. It's a huge, it's a huge class. What if instead I just took, I just took like a few students and um, 
looked at a sample. Let's say I just randomly sampled nine from that large class. What would I expect to see? If this is for the larger class, what would I expect to see as a result of the nine? Now, it sounds really weird, right? It's such a huge population. But what would be true? What what pattern would would be ex what what pattern could would be revealed if I just took a nine? Well, the nine that I took is one sample I could draw from the whole population. Um, and there could have been other, you know, there's infinitely not infinitely many, but there's all possible samples of nine that I could have had, okay? The one sample of nine that I collect comes from a distribution of samples, but I got one, I just got one of them. And what do I expect to see in that? What would be the distribution that it comes from? What would be the mean? Would it be the same? So. The idea is I got a sample of nine that I took, but that nine comes from a, uh, a popular, like a population of sample means. Okay. That, that result of nine comes from a population of samples of size nine. So I describe that here. Like this. So this is my original population. Imagine these are all the grades here of the students. And I'm going to draw a nine and I calculate a mean from the nine. But then I go back and get another nine and I calculate the mean of those nine. And I go back and get another nine and I calculate the mean of those nine. And I generate, I put dot, dot, dot. Imagine all possible combinations of nine. What do you expect to see in what's called the sampling distribution of the sample means? What you expect to see, also, I think the example I use in the course videos is uh, the blood pressure. When you get your blood pressure tested, um, these are all the possible measures uh, that you could have. And you just take a sample. Um, so if you get your blood pressure read, sometimes they take it once, but if they want to be more thorough, they take it many times because when you sit down to get your blood pressure read, many people are just nervous, right? They're uncomfortable. It's it's cold. The equipment is cold. Somebody's there. Their blood pressure uh, may change. So it's better to take it a few times while the patient is sitting there and take an average as the result. That's another way to think about it. Now, why do they do that? Because that sample <clears throat> that they take... <clears throat> is one of many they could have taken. And what is the truth about, or what is the, what do we know about the population of the many? We know that in that, <clears throat> on average, you will get the population mean. So out of the one that you got, it comes from a distribution of possible samples of size nine, whose expected value is identical. But if you think about taking the means as opposed to just the original value that you got, the one, um, like the, the blood pressure reading, for example, over here, these will be more stable between them. Even though the blood pressure readings have a large variation or different, you know, the vary there's a there's a broader variation compared to the variation between the sample means that you've taken. So you can think about these as different possible samples. The average of those or the the relationship between the averages is that they're closer together than the relationship between the original values. Okay. So you've kind of stabilized the your result by taking a sample so that's the nature of like taking a sample right it's more stable in that you're closer to the true mean that's actually what what is going on here i made these a little more 
a little smaller to show that they're closer together visually than these are. So that's what's going to happen. And, and the theory says that, in fact, this is the standard deviation. This is the mean of the original. Then the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample mean is going to be the same, but the standard deviation is going to be smaller. It's going to be smaller by a factor dividing by the sample size. So the larger the sample size, the smaller the standard deviation. So the larger the sample size, the closer together or closer to the true mean are all of your um, sample means. So if we calculate this, this is 2.9 divided by square root of 9, which gives what? Okay, so I'm gonna keep two more decimals than I started, so it's gonna be six, seven. So 0 0.967. So this is the result. Now this is, so the, the, the mean is the same, but the standard deviation is smaller, reflecting the fact that my means are closer together or closer to the true mean than the original values. And then I use this result to make a prediction. So originally my my issue was, okay, so uh, I, I made the, I created the example that this is representing a large class. I just take a sample of nine and I expect that those nine will have a mean of 13.8. Um, so not that their mean is gonna be 13.8, but it comes from the nine that I got, the, the expected value. I expect the, dis, the, the mean to be around 13.8 on average with a standard deviation of 0.967. Now using that result, what's the chance that a student gets more than 15? Well, 15, I said the test was out of 15, so well, anyway, but they can get larger than 15. They can't because <laughs> the test is out of 15. Let's say there's bonus points. Okay, so it's out of 15, but they can have bonus points. I'm just trying to make this a relatable problem because it doesn't have a storyline. But let's check what's the chance with this criteria. Obviously, it's a normal distribution, so there has to be some, you know, there has to be a chance for higher I guess it's a test. It has to be out of more, else it's not really normal. But um, okay. So let's see if the the chance of having a mean greater than fifteen. So the mean result of the nine is greater than fifteen. What's the chance of that? So how do I figure that out? Well, I use Sorry, I forgot to put the shape. So I forgot to add that the, the mean and the standard deviation relationship, but also the shape is identical, right? It's also going to be normal. So I'm going to use the normal distribution to interpret my result. So that means if I wanted to find out what's the chance that X bar is greater than 15, then I standardize 15 minus 13.8 divided by 0 0.967. And what do you get? So the point is you're going to use the new distribution for the sample.
and and then finish the problem, right? So you're going to do this, and you're going to go 1.24, and you're going to find this by first getting the left side off the table. One point two four. Four is here. Point nine eight. Uh, eight nine two five. Also, the other way to get the answer is remember you can change the sign and the direction and get the same answer if you did this. And you should be able to get the answer. Let's see, negative 1.24. Ten seventy five, right? Okay, so the chance that uh, the chance is ten point seven five percent. All right, so this kind of a problem is when you're working with a variable that is that is a, like normally distributed, basically. So it's a measurement, it's a weight, it's a height, it's um, it could be the score on a test. And I have several examples here, several more examples for you to try and answers. And, and then I talk about control charts. I have some videos about that. So you guys can finish all of this. So you guys should be able to finish module eight today. If you haven't started inference, you need to start right away. Here's a summary on your formula sheet. What does it say? If X has a mean of mu, so you're starting out with a mean and standard deviation. It doesn't say anything here about the normal distribution, okay? If X has a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, the sampling distribution of X bar, that's the story I tell about, you're gonna draw a sample, but that sample comes from a distribution of a bunch of other samples of the same size. What do you expect? You expect to see the same mean, but a tighter standard deviation, okay? It's much more narrow, and I describe that in the videos. Now, this doesn't say anything about a normal distribution. The example that I just gave you did say something about it. So there's a second result that's really important that is known as the central limit theorem. And it says, oh, I... Never mind. They're going to what happened? Okay. It says that it says that if X is not normally distributed, so this result holds true if X is originally um, not normally distributed as long as you have a large enough, you're taking a large enough sample size. And that's really important result. As long as your sample size that you're drawing is more than 25, this is still true in approximation. So I describe that here. I write it out explicitly here. This is really important because 
often when we draw a sample, we don't know anything about the population and it's, you know, it's shape, it's distribution. Here. So here on page 32, I have the results. So this is what I just explained to you. If you begin with a distribution that's normal with a mean and standard deviation given, then you know that if you're to draw a sample, that sample comes from a distribution of sample, possible samples of the same size with the same mean as the variable um, variables mean, but a tighter standard deviation. Also, the distribution is normal. The distribution of those sample means. If you don't have, you see, I didn't put the N in here. If you don't have a normal distribution, you still get the same result in approximation as long as the sample size you're drawing is large enough. So this is why if, you, if you've ever done statistics before or... Um, <clears throat> You know, you ever hear people talk about statistics? You need a you need a reasonable sample size to get to to use the assumptions of statistics. Okay, you need a reasonable sample size. In this case, if you're going to use the normal distribution as their approximation, you have to have a sample size more than twenty five, twenty five or more. Okay. So if mu is unknown, Oh, so this is what we're going to get into um, with regards. So we're going to use these results in inference where right now I'm giving you the information of the about the population's distribution, the, pop, the population, the characteristic, it's population's distribution. I give you the information. Here I don't give you that I don't give you the sample distribution I mean the the distribution or the shape of the distribution of the population characteristic but as long as the sample size that I draw is more than 25 I can in approximation assume that the mean comes from a distribution of means that is normally distributed so what I'm going to do in inference is um is I'm going to lean on these theory, the theory that I've developed above and start taking away some of the information, well, particularly information on the sample proportion, or sorry, information on the pro true proportion, information on the true mean, and information on the true standard deviation. I'm going to take that those, I'm going to strip away that information and still rely on the theory above to be able to say something about what to believe about what the true um what the true proportion is or the true mean is. And that's going to be useful because what we do in practice is we take a sample and we try and say this estimates the number or the proportion of people who support the Democrats or the proportion of people who who support the PNP, right? So it's going to, that's what we're going to do. How would we even know that? Well, we're going to use statistical theory to do it. Okay, so just one more point about the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is just this result here. If you don't know, that x is approximately normal, that isn't safe. 
if you don't know that x is approximately normal sorry if you don't know that x is distributed normal maybe i'll, I'll write it In fact, X doesn't have to be normally distributed. That's the beauty of it. And I'll show, and I demonstrate that in the videos that I made. Okay, so what's all this about? So here is where inference begins. So you, we have a few minutes, eight minutes. I'm going to do a run through here. So this is a looking forward where we're heading. So this is what you're going to be practicing this week. This is known as inference. The first regards the inference on what? Notice, look at these formula here, and I'm going to explain why I have it in columns and all that, and what all these are. <clears throat> Notice that none of these have P in them. This is for inference on a population proportion with not knowing the population proportion. So this is inference. Let me write it here. So this is inference on uh, What does inference mean? How are we using the word inference? So inference is using information we have What is the best guess you have for the estimate? We don't know. Sorry, what's the best guess you have for the true proportion? So this is inference on the true proportion. So the actual, what it actually is without having any information on it. Okay, what's infer? What, what could it possibly be the true proportion if P is unknown? Notice in all these formulas, there's no P. There's variations of P, I have P hat. So I'm gonna use the sample proportion to estimate P. I'm gonna make an interval, you see? That's like an interval. And then here, I'm gonna use P star. Now, what is P star? You're gonna learn, or if you don't, if you don't know already, um, to estimate the sample size I need to um, estimate the true proportion. And here, there's no P, but there's variations of P. I have the sample proportion, and I have something called P zero. So. That's what this is. So this is inference. This is trying to estimate the true proportion. And the next one, number five, this is inference on mu. Mu is not known, of course. Seems like an obvious. But sigma is known. So you can make some assumptions, maybe from previous research. You're going to take a sample, and you're going to try and estimate the true mean, so the mean income or um, the mean weight. So we're gonna you're gonna see an example where we're gonna look at the uh, at, at weights, um, different measures, right? So this is not the proportion, but it's a it's a measurement that we don't know. We're gonna take a sample and we're gonna assume that we know sigma either from previous research. We're going to read papers and see what other people found for the standard deviation in the past, or we're going to, um, you know, we have some insight. You know, we had a dream and it came in our dreams that we have some sort of insight about what the standard deviation could be. And then these will be our estimates, or these will be the statistics or things that we can calculate. Okay. 
And then the last one is going to be the case inference on mu. So we're going to try and estimate mu. Mu is unknown, but also sigma is unknown. And that is the most realistic case. And you're going to see most of the exercises use these formulas here. Okay. And that's going to be the end of the material for the course. You're, you're going to um, appreciate that like this is basically the same formula, except because I don't know sigma, I use S instead. S is the best or unbiased estimate of sigma. Unbiased just means that um, in repeated sampling, like I described before, theoretically, on average, S is the best predictor of sigma, sample, sample standard deviation. And because I substitute S for sigma, I have to introduce a new distribution called T in place of Z. And honestly, that's basically the course. You just have to practice and practice so you're confident with all these. All this should look familiar. Notice, what is this here? What is this here? We saw this above. What is this thing? There's P hats in it, but it looks like this one up here. It looks like the standard deviation of the sample proportion. Okay, it's the standard deviation of the sample proportion. This is the standard deviation. So what this is, is actually estimating P with the estimate, the sample proportion, give or take some standard deviation. This is a standard deviation, some measure of standard deviations from the mean. This is going back to the discussion we had about taking a normal distribution and talking about estimating one, two, three standard deviations from the mean. That's actually what that is. That's called a confidence interval. In this column, we have confidence intervals. In this co second column, we have estimates of what your sample size should be, which is really important. How do you know how to take a sample to make an estimate? You need to know the sample size or an estimate of you know what the sample size should be. And then finally, what is this? What does this look like to you? So this thing on the bottom, what is that? What does it look like? Doesn't it also look like this one? Do you see the pattern? Doesn't it also look like this one? What is this thing up here? Put it in the chat. What is this that I'm circling? You guys have to say it properly. This is the standard deviation of the sample proportion. Standard deviation of the sample proportion, that's what it is. It's a standard deviation. And here, it's the, it's the standard deviation of the sample proportion, okay? You drum it in your head. It's the standard deviation of the sample proportion. And look how I'm using it here. What is this that I'm circling? I'll put the video up if you guys have to go. This is the standardized value. You see, this is the value here at P hat minus this value, which is going to be the hypothesized mean divided by the standard deviation. This is a standardized score. You see, we get a Z. So what this column is are the standardized values of the estimate. So that's all it is. You guys are going to have an in intense week. The notes, there's a lot of notes. I'll focus on the videos and getting through some problems. And uh, the notes are really just a reference at this point because there's so many pages. And a lot of the pages are just exercises, lots of problems and problems and problems. All right. So I wish you luck this week. Next week, I'm going to focus on inference. We're going to solve problems. 
Hopefully I don't have to do another review because I, I do it in, in the videos. And we'll just be solving problems and preparing for the exam. Okay. Really print out this uh, formula sheet and, and work with it because everything is on this formula sheet. Okay, any questions for me? Otherwise, I'm going to say have a good weekend. I'll put up some more connect exercises, sure. Professor, uh, there is a question in the chat. Are we going to have more connect assignments? I just said yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did it here. Uh, October 5th. I don't know why I, I put up the grades for October 5th and everyone's asked, not everyone, I'm getting a lot of questions about the, not grades, but the attendance. I don't know why it's not showing, but I, I believe I did it properly. No, we can see it. But some people are saying they have the wrong score, but check again, because I updated it last, last week. Because I think I had the wrong scores in there. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but there were, I had some. I had the the grades and people have been asking me and they were seeing a different grade for some reason. But anyway, it's it's corrected now. If you don't have any score on the fifth, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure, Jordan, I scored you, but I'll check it again. I'll check it again. You guys should have a score. I mean, I can I can check it now if you have a moment. Let me stop the recording.